I'm going to be preaching out of Haggai 2, 4, and 7. The title of this morning's message is, Once more, I will fill my house. Once more, I will fill my house. We're talking about Pentecost this morning. Pentecost, meaning 50 days, the Jewish festival, Shavuot, or Feast of Weeks. Seven weeks from Passover until this Jewish festival, Pentecost. 50 days from the resurrection to when the Holy Ghost fell in the upper room. Now, Shavuot is a Jewish festival that is actually the festival of the harvest. Say harvest. We love the harvest here at Nations Church. It's, it's the celebration of the incoming of the harvest. It's one of three major pilgrimage festivals in the Jewish calendar. And this is why in Acts chapter 2, the Bible says that they, they were all nations that were gathered in Jerusalem because they were celebrating Shavuot, the harvest festival. So when the Bible says in Acts 2, and we as good Pentecostals all know this well, and when the day of Pentecost, Shavuot, fully come, on, on the day they celebrated the harvest, on that day, suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting. And they were all, say all, filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, I find that interesting that on the harvest festival, the harvest came in. They were filled with the Holy Ghost, and then we know Peter went out and he preached, and 5,000 were saved. There was harvest at the harvest festival. You see, church, I want to tell you this morning, Pentecost has a purpose. Pentecost has a purpose. It's not just a bunch of holy rollers with lively music and summer revival services. It's much, much, much more than that. Amen? You see, the, the whole Christian life is a life that's lived by the Holy Spirit. We're born again by the Holy Spirit. We know that. We're filled with the Holy Spirit and we walk by the Spirit. So I, I want to get, get this out of our understanding. It's not just some weird or strange thing when we talk about being filled with the Holy Spirit. It's normal. It's normal. This is actually the normal Christian life. You know, I, I said it last year when I preached on the Holy Ghost. You know, people, people think we're weird. Well, listen, people may be weird, but the Holy Ghost ain't weird. His, his presence is actually the standard of the Christian life. Actually, it's essential that we have the Holy Spirit working in our lives, in this community, nation's church. If, if we're going to accomplish anything of significance in the kingdom of God, we need the Holy Spirit. We need His activity. We need His fire. We need His oil. We need His flame. We need His transformative power. We need His enablement. We need His gifts. We need His fruit. We need the power of God. Now, it's normal. It's normal. If you're watching online, it should be normal. Someone say normal again. Normal. We see it all through Scripture, and we're going to look at our text, Haggai chapter 2. Now, let me give you a quick background. Now, I didn't finish my message the first sermon, so I'm going to try to speak a little quicker this service. Haggai 2. Background, real quick. So you have the children of Israel. They were in captivity 70 years. The Babylonians and then the Persians. They're in, they're in captivity. They're not in Jerusalem. They're not in their homeland. And while they're in captivity, the house of the Lord, the temple, lie in ruins. Now, the king of Persia at that time, Cyrus, agreed to allow a, a team to go back to Jerusalem and to build the temple back. That's good news. So the uh, king of Persia, Cyrus, sent Zerubbabel. Say Zerubbabel. I love that name. Any Zerubbabels in the house? Any? Okay, it's not a popular name right now, I understand. <laughs> so Zerubbabel took Joshua and a team back to Jerusalem to build 
the temple back. Now Haggai, which we're reading from, is the prophet that's speaking on behalf of the Lord to the people in regarding the building of the temple. Now if we go to Haggai 2, my Bible calls this section a call to build the house of the Lord. I love that. Verse 4, listen to what it says. Yet now be strong. This is the Lord speaking through Haggai. O Zerubbabel declares the Lord be strong. O Joshua, son of Zedok, the high priest, be strong, all ye people of the land, declares the Lord. Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. Verse 5, according to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit remains in your midst, so fear not. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once more, or once again, in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake the nations so that the treasure of all nations shall come in. And I will fill my house with glory. I'm going to say it again for me. And I will fill my house with glory. Glory, says the Lord of hosts. I'm sorry, I'm going to have fun up here today. You may not, but I'm going to have fun. Hallelujah. The first point this morning is that the people of God are called to build the house of God by his spirit. The Lord speaks through Haggai here and say, hey guys, it's time to get to work. Now actually in context, in Haggai chapter 1, when they got back to Jerusalem to build the house of God, how many of you know they actually didn't go straight to building? They actually began to work on their own homes and work on their own fences and on their own gardens while the house of God remained in ruins. So the Lord speaks to Haggai and says, hey guys, verse 4, be strong all ye people, declares the Lord and he says this very directly work say work you know basically get your hammer out it's time uh, to get to business it's time to work on the house of the Lord and then he says this for I am with you declares the Lord of hosts how many of you it's good news that you know if you have to go to work God's with us Right? If we got a call from God and God's called us into this church and this community and the ministry, the good news, he says, get to work. But I want to tell you something. I'm not telling you to go by yourself. I'm here to tell you that I'm with you. I'm with you. We have some building to do, right, church? We got some building to do. But it's not just the local church, nation's church, which is awesome what God is doing here. But it's, it's the, the church church of Jesus Christ, the, the bringing of people into the kingdom of God. It's about the nations. And the Lord says here, I want you to get to work, but, but I am with you, and that's the key. The church is to be built by the people of God through his presence. Now, what is his presence? It's, it's him present with us. It's the evidence, the proof, the substance of God's attendance in your life, in my life. It's God's hand up saying, I'm present with you, that, that I'm with you always. His presence makes everything possible. We look in verse 5, the Lord says through Haggai, my spirit is in your midst, or another way to put it, my spirit's in your gatherings. When you come together in your corporateness, my Holy Spirit's going to be with you. So he goes on to say, do not fear, for I am with you. How many of you know, when, when God's Spirit's with us, just like we were worshiping this morning and something did you, did you sense a shift? There, there was like a change in the atmosphere. Something as we were glorifying Jesus and his majesty and his goodness and his awesomeness. All of a sudden, something changed in the atmosphere. My spirit is in your gatherings. So do not fear. It's good news that, that this thing is it's not dependent on how good I am. Somebody say Amen. How smart you are, amen. How strong we are, how good our hammer is, how, how efficient we are at building this thing. I can build structures and I can build policies and procedures. We, be, we could become awfully good with the hammer. We could become pros at the hammer. But it's not about how good we are with the hammer. It's about the Holy Ghost. 
It's not the hammer, but it's the Holy Spirit's fire. It's the fire. It's the oil of the Spirit that this thing is built with. It's, it's His enablement. How many of you know without the oil, this thing isn't burning. This thing, there's no fuel here. This thing isn't burning brightly for the world to see. It's dead. It's empty. It's off. It's useless. But a little oil. <laughs> a little oil makes it effective. It's the fire that fuels us to do the work. The oil that keeps us burning and effective. Now, Zerubbabel was tasked with this major project, right? Like building the temple of God, building the house of the Lord. That, that's quite a task. And I can imagine he was intimidated by this and he needed some encouragement. He needed, he needed to hear from God. So we see this in Zechariah chapter four, verse six, that the Lord gives Zerubbabel some encouragement. And listen to what it says. Then the Lord said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. So what, what is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel? What is the direction for building the house of God? Here it is. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. There was an old song we used to sing back in the day. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, I'm no singer. Come on. We got singers. But I like to remind myself, it's not by my might. It's not by my power. It's by my spirit, saith the Lord. The temple, the house, the work of God, the ministry, our ministries, our families, our businesses are going to be built by the flame of the Holy Spirit and not by what we can produce ourselves. And we see that in Acts. Let's fast forward to the book of Acts. Jesus ascends. So we got, we've got the resurrection on Easter. 40 days later, the ascension. So Jesus was on earth with the disciples 40 days. Then he ascends to the Father. And then he says to them, listen, I'm, I'm ascending, but I got a job for you. I got a big job for you. You're going to build my church. You're actually going to go to all the nations and preach the good news that I came and I was victorious over death, hell, and the grave. He ascends, and then he says, but listen, I don't want any of you to do anything yet. He said, don't, don't go anywhere. Don't, don't start preaching don't start building the church. He said, I want you to go and I want you to wait. He told the builders, the apostles in Acts 1-4, don't go anywhere but wait for the Holy Spirit to come upon you. I'm going to send you the very means to accomplish all that I'm asking you to do, disciples. I have a great work for you to spread the message of Jesus, but wait until the Holy Ghost comes. It was an impossible task to build the church without the Spirit of God. It's like God said, it's like Jesus said to them, I got this. I'm not leaving you guys on your own. I'm on the job. I'm going to be intimately involved with the building of my house. Church Pentecost reminds us that it's only what he does by his Spirit and through his people that has any true kingdom effectiveness. I'm going to say it again. It's only what God does himself by his spirit through the people of God that has any true kingdom effectiveness, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Look at it in verse 4, Haggai 2, verse 6. Haggai verse 2 and 6. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once more in, in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land and I will shake the nations so that the treasures of the nations shall come in. My next point this morning is God fills his people to shake the nations of the earth. I'll say it again. God fills his people to shake the nations of the earth. You know, when McCoby was up here earlier, to, earlier this morning and he reads those numbers up and this place erupts with celebration. Why is that? Because the nations are shaking. The nations are shaking with the gospel of Jesus because where the Holy Ghost is, 
the nations begin to shake. Where the Holy Spirit is, there's harvest. When the Spirit of God moves in our midst, we are driven to win the harvest for Jesus. And the nations begin to shake. And here we see in Haggai, he says, I'm going to shake the nations. And we see this in Acts. Look at Acts 1 and 8. But, we all know this, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you're going to be my witnesses where? In the nations. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the nations. You see the connection? The Holy Spirit comes upon us and witnesses. Spirit of God falls on Pentecost. Peter preaches, 5,000 saved. There's a connection between the Holy Ghost filling us and us reaching the nations. That's why I love that the, the name of this community here is Nations Church. From, from neighborhoods to nations, impacting people with the gospel of Jesus. So Acts 1.8 says, go to the nations, but filled with the Holy Spirit. Then look at the very next chapter, Acts 2, of course. The Holy Spirit comes down. There's a fire on all of their head. They're filled with the Holy Ghost. And then verse 5. There were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. Do you hear that? Every nation was gathered for the Feast of Shavuot, for the Feast of Weeks. The Holy Spirit fell, and it says here, and when the sound occurred, the multitudes came together, and they were confused because everyone heard them speak in their own language. They were all amazed, and they marveled. marveled. Every nation on earth heard the preaching of the gospel right there at Acts 2, 5, and 8. I just love how the, the, the church, right at the very beginning, the birth of the church started in diversity. Every nation, every language was touched by the Holy Spirit right in Acts 2, 5, and 8. I mean, the, the loud uh, Brazilians were there, and the Puerto Ricans were there, and the Mexicans were there, and the French were there, and the Italians were there, amen. The Irish were there. Even the English were there. They had their tea. A little cup of tea with them. Now, I'm using, I'm, I'm, I'm using a little license here. I know those nations weren't around, but at this time, every nation was there at Pentecost. They heard the message. The Holy Ghost fell. Peter preached, and every nation was impacted through, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It happened just like that. The nations began to shake that day, and I tell you what, they're still shaking today. Acts 2.47 goes on to say, and the Lord added to their church every single day. This is a new, the New Testament church. Oh, beloved, we must have the Holy Spirit in our midst. The Holy Spirit must be in our gatherings, in our worship, in our ministry, in our families, in our businesses, and in our churches. Listen to me, our, our only hope is that he would work through us by the Spirit of God to accomplish the mission he set before us, that we are completely lost without his presence, and the greatest need of our hour is for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit that will shake the nations of the earth. And I say, do it again, Lord. Do it again, Lord. Shake us with your power. May we burn brighter and brighter for you, oh God. Oh, our only hope, church. We got to have the oil in the lamp. Man, I was trying to light this as a test yesterday. I've never lit a lantern before. Some of you are pros. But I, I put the oil in there, and I put the wick, and I, and I tried to light it. Nothing happened. Nothing happened. Nothing happened. Nothing happened. Then one of my friends said, you know what? You got you to gotta soak that wick in the oil for a while. <laughs> and you, <laughs> you got to allow that, that oil, that oil to soak that cloth. And that, that oil is going to begin to make its way up to that very top of that wick. And I did that. And I let it soak in there. And then I took a match to that thing. And it... Whoosh, we got to allow the oil of the Holy Ghost to saturate us, to soak us. Come, Holy Spirit. Come and fill your people that we may burn for thee. Oh, send the fire. Send the fire, Lord. 
Hallelujah, hallelujah. God, we need the Holy Ghost and fire to do the work you've called us to do. We need the oil of the Holy Spirit. God, we can't do it without you. We need more of you. Let there be another Pentecost in our day and our hour, Lord Jesus. I, I, my last point this morning, I, and I believe this with all my heart, there is a coming glory to the church. There is a glory coming to the church. Now, Nathan Morris is here. Nathan, you know a little bit about this. We've, we've tasted, right? We've tasted you don't, those of you that don't know my testimony, I don't have time to go into today, but I was part of a very significant move of God in the 1990s called the Brownsville Revival. And I tasted of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And I love what the Lord is doing these days, but there's a coming glory. We tasted it this morning, did you? We felt it in the atmosphere, it's like, God wants to do something. He wants to do something. He wants to do something in your life. He wants to do something more in your ministry. He wants to do. I, God, God wants to shake us up out of our complacency. We're kind of going through the motions, just trying to go week by week and day by day and just hanging on, holding on. If I can get tomorrow and the next day, but God's saying, I want to send the glory into your life. I want to send the glory into your life and your life and your ministry and your churches and your cities and your Jerusalems, your Judeas, your Samarias and the uttermost parts of the earth. There's a coming glory. We got to let the fire burn. I feel like some people just like, well, that's a, that's a little much there. Pastor Russ, now can we, can we turn that? There we go. That's better. That's better right there. Just controlled fire. <laughs> I'm, I'm, you can do that, uh, do that in your home groups. <laughs> do it before church. Uh-oh. This is Sunday morning. You know, you don't, don't get too excited. We got a lot to do. They're trying to put the fire out. Where, where is this? Oh, no, let's see. Right. I think we need a little of this. Let's see here. Let me go. <laughs> we need to turn this thing up right here now. Now, uh, I promised the school I wouldn't. <laughs> I better lower this. Oh, right. Bring it down. Okay. Only, oh, whoa. Hallelujah. 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 Let the fire burn, God. Yeah. Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, come, come Lord Jesus, Woo! hallelujah, last point, last point, there's a coming glory to the church, I believe this, I really do, look at verse 6, for thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once more, Yet once more, in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake the nations so that the treasures of all nations shall come in, and I will fill my house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. I love that. Once more. He says, one, one, once more. Just once more, Lord. Would you? Nathan, will you do it once more? I feel like in my lifetime, I've, I've seen it once. I've seen it once. But, but my prayers, Lord, in my lifetime, just once more. And in a little while, not, not too long from now. But God, God, in a little while, once more, fill our houses with your glory. Fill Nation's Church with your glory. Fill America with your glory. Fill the nations of the earth with your glory. In context here, you got to understand, 
the, the children of Israel were in captivity for 70 years. Before this, they were used to the tabernacle and the temple and the fire. By nights, there was a cloud by day. The priest couldn't even stand to minister because of the glory of God. But there were 70 years. 70. 70. That's a long time. That's a long time. No fire. No glory. They were just going through the motions. Making do. Making do. But then the Lord says to them, I'm going to do it again. I'm going to do it again. Now the children of Israel didn't really have context from this. Only thing thing they knew is they knew what their their dad told them and, and they knew what their granddaddy told them. They knew of the stories, but they, they didn't have the experience. I feel like I'm entering into that age myself where I'm telling my kids, well, 1996 was special. 97 was amazing. And I tell them stories and I share about the glory of the Lord and the power of God. But they're not, they haven't seen it themselves. You see, church, the the presence of God with his people has always been the norm. Now, I don't have a lot of time to go through these scriptures, only a few minutes, but I want to read a couple before we take this in and we begin to pray because the Spirit of the Lord is here this morning and he wants to touch us and he wants to revive us for the mission ahead for So many of you are going out and you're winning so many to Jesus. You're going into the nations and the streets. But God God wants to fill us with his oil. You're watching online. He wants to fill you with oil. The glory of the Lord. He empowers us to do the work. And this has always been the norm. Look, 2 Chronicles 5.14. Then the temple of the Lord was filled with a cloud. And the priests could not perform their services because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the temple of God. Second Chronicles 7, 1 Chronicles 7.1 When Solomon finished praying, fire came down from the sky. And the glory of the Lord filled the temple. The priests could not enter the Lord's temple because the glory of the temple because the glory of the Lord filled it. And when all the Israelites saw the fire and the glory, they bowed down on the pavement before the Lord. When His glory comes, you can't help but get low before the Lord. It's always been the norm. Exodus 34, 29, when Moses came down from the mountain, he had the two tablets and he was not aware that his face was radiating with the glory of the Lord. So much so that Moses had to put a veil over his face to protect him and the people. Exodus 13, the tabernacle had a fire by night and a cloud by day. Ezekiel 10 and 4. Then the glory of the Lord stood over the threshold of the house and the house was filled with the cloud and full of the brightness of the Lord's glory. First Kings 8, when the priests left the holy place, a cloud filled the temple and the priests could not carry out their duties because of the glory of the Lord. Yet once more. Over the last 200 years in our nation, And I'm closing with this because my time is just about up. I love to study revivals in the move of God. Stephen's the same way. The last 200 years in our nation, America, there's been a moving of the Holy Spirit every generation. Every generation. Every 20 to 25 years. Every generation. Everyone. Study it. I don't have time to go over the last 200 years, but I will from 19, early 1900s. There was the Azusa Street Revival, William Seymour. Baptism of the Holy Spirit and the birth of the Assemblies of God and the Church of God and the Church of God in Christ. 
The Holy Spirit moved in the early 1900s in such an amazing way. The glory of the Lord was so rich. And then the 1920s, Maria Whitworth Eder and Smith Wigglesworth. And you could study about these traveling ministers who saw the glory of the Lord all over America. The 1940s and 50s, the healing revival, the tent revivals of the, the 50s. That generation had a mighty move of God with Jack Coe and so many others. Then in the 1970s, the charismatic renewal, when the Holy Spirit moved into the Baptist churches and the Lutheran churches and the Presbyterian churches. And I actually come out of the charismatic Catholic movement and my priest was filled with the Holy Ghost. The nuns were filled with the Holy Ghost. Then the Jesus movement, the Jesus movement, the hippies, the hippies got filled their sandals and their long hair and they couldn't even keep up with all the baptisms of so many coming to the Lord. There was a great revival in the 1970s. It was amazing. I hear stories of Catherine Kuhlman and the Jesus movements. Oh, and then the 80s came. Oh, the 80s. <laughs> it was dry for the most part. The 80s was a dry time, but people started getting hungry and saying once more let the glory of the Lord return to the church and then in the mid 90s early 90s the Argentine revival the glory of God in Argentina hit and then it hit in Toronto up in Canada the Toronto blessing and then it spread on Father's Day of 1995 in Pensacola Florida there was a great revival that hit America and the nations of the world in the 1990s it's been about 25 years. We're due. We're due. We're due. Actually, Nathan, we're, we're long overdue. We're due. We're due. We're due for a revival. This, these guys, this generation, it's their time. It's their time. It's their time. It's this. this. My, my heart's for these guys. I saw it when I was 18 and 19 and 20, but there's a revival coming to this generation. Jenner, once more, once more, once more, Generation C will see the glory of God. Fill the temple, fill the temple. Come on, do it again, God. Once more in a little while, fill your house. Fill your people, God. Come on, let's stand to our feet. Do it, Lord. Oh, God. Do it, God, in this generation. Do it in our generation, God. Lord, we're hungry for you. Once more, would you fill the temple of God? Jesus. Jesus.